Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so the uh, first question is about cosmoses. So what does the concept of cosmoses look like between incarnations? So um, it's it's a little bit um, uh, odd uh, because if you leave your body, your spirit is free, and usually it feels uh, attracted to its own cosmos. Uh, so in between incarnations, most people spend time in the cosmos they're most attuned to, and only when they go into the like uh, the lower. Um, the lower vibrations, um, then you have this, um, uh, in a way, intermingling of cosmoses. Um, so if, if you look at, for instance, the, the formless powers, uh, the formless powers, uh, they belong to one of the cosmoses, and um, they are quite uh, pure in that. So a, a god or a goddess can belong to one of these four cosmoses and they work with the spirits which are in there and also the spirit um, even of an enlightened being is often isolated in their own in their own cosmos. But as soon as you leave the, uh, the formless world and go into the world of form then the cosmoses start to mix. So as soon as you, uh, in a way, become part of um, a solar system or a, a species like humans or cats or dogs, uh, then already there is a mixing of all these cosmoses in the collective consciousness of your species. Um, and uh, yeah, if you go more more deeply into it, and you yeah form a spirit. Uh, then and the spirit also goes from incarnation to incarnation. It also takes energies of all these cosmoses uh, with it from one incarnation to another. So what you often see is that when you while you're living, uh, the energy body gets a little bit confused and a little bit uh, tensed by the mixing of all these energies. And when you die, you go more towards your own cosmos. Uh, in between the incarnations, so it's kind of a purification process. You start to remember more uh, what is my path, what is my goal, what is really the, the cosmos I belong to. But as soon as you yeah, go more deeply into the incarnation, again, the energies start to mix and you tend to get a little bit more confused. Um, but it is also true that uh, different egregores are more attuned to one cosmos or another. And even also different species are more attuned to one cosmos or another. Um, and so it is not um, very clear cut uh, because often if you, uh, if you change species, so for instance you've had some lives as a dog and you start incarnating as a human, then also you uh, have a very different relationship to all these other cosmoses and you have a very different position in all these cosmoses, uh, because your uh, your power, your level of control, your level of harmony will will change. Uh, so, for instance, if you change from a dog into a human, then if you look at the at the nature cosmos, you will probably move down. You will be lower on the ladder because your body will be more disharmonized. Uh, you will have more thoughts, more internal conflicts, more internal confusion, and all this disharmony. It's placing you. Yes. Yes. So, for instance, you're a dog first, and then you die, and then you decide, okay, I will incarnate in a human body now. <laughs> so, your position in the nature cosmos it will become lower, because the human being is generally less harmonious, uh, less open, less connected than a dog. Because a dog is very much into a collective consciousness, it thinks about the group, humans are more individualist, so you actually yeah, uh, go into a lower level of that cosmos, if you look at it from the, the nature perspective. But if you look at it from the Luciferical cosmos perspective, then you're actually moving upward. 
because as a human being you can have more understanding, uh, you have a better mind, you have a better memory, uh, you have more uh, control over yourself, uh, so you become a higher being. But in a way a higher being or a lower being is very much depending upon which cosmos yeah, um, you look from, so which measure uh, you use. Um, also if you look from the um, uh, divine cosmos perspective, um, often it's also a step down as a human being um, because uh, often uh, animals, uh, lower life forms, are just uh, very easy to go along with whatever higher impulses or whatever guidance they receive. And humans tend to develop a lot more ego, so in a way our evolution into humanity um, yeah, degrades our status in the in the uh, uh, divine cosmos and in the uh, nature cosmos, but we get a higher status in Luciferical cosmos and we also get a higher status in Arimanic cosmos. Yeah, uh, I will just repeat the question because I'm recording it. So, isn't it a necessary step for a monad to incarnate in human form? Um, well, that's very depending on, on yeah, what you would see as, as, yeah, as human form. So, a physically human being? Uh, no, uh, it is not necessary. Uh, according to me, I know that the school tradition thinks differently about it, but um, um, what is uh, 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 necessary is to um, to work uh, to to perfect yourself using forms which relate to your um, uh, yeah to your sinful qualities which create the division between you and the absolute and um, each of us have different imperfections which disturb our relationship with the Absolute. We all have different sins. And um, to be able to transform the sins, we need to have um, a form which can reflect those sins. So you need to be able to express what is wrong with you, and you need to be able to fix what is wrong with you. Um, so it is... Um, very necessary to have a, a form with, which has a good uh, reflective capability which can uh, reflect the nature of your spirit very well and this is actually one of the reasons that there are so many life forms on this planet and also in other solar systems because we all have our own uh, yeah relationship with the absolute and because Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, but, but basically the um yeah, the, yeah yes what I would uh, uh define as a sin is basically uh anything which disturbs our relationship with the absolute. That's what I would define as sin. And these sins were already existing before we started to manifest ourselves otherwise we would still be in the in the unfallen universe um, and um, these uh, sins can manifest in in many different ways or many different forms and many different shapes and some of the sins are very uh, particular to uh, to the form we take but they're generally reflections of already sins on a, which exist on a higher level. Um, 
So for instance, the, the sin of greed, of uh, wanting to have more money and more things, and well, in some forms it is simply impossible because an animal cannot carry more or possess more than it can carry in its mouth. So it is very uh, typical for yeah, a human form or human-like forms to have uh, greed as a sin. Um, and these are actually also reasons because these sins exist on a spiritual level, the desire to have more, to have more control, to desire more, to collect more. And we actually, um, forms are created so these sins can be reflected in the, in the physical shape. Uh, so we can see them, we can work with them more easily. Um, so ultimately the, the, the higher worlds, the formless worlds, they are reflected in the uh, in the unif in the form universe, and um, in a way, all the um, yeah qualities of the form universe are again reflections of the formless universe. Mm. Yes, so above, so below, indeed. And um, yeah, the uh, the learning of our our spirits very much continues if we go back. Um, into our original cosmos. We can do this during our lives or also in between our lives. And uh, uh, the nice thing about that is if you go back to your um, original cosmos, you tend to um, see things from a very different perspective. And there's actually this change of perspective which uh, helps you to alter yourself. Um, so, for instance, if I'm here and I'm having a problems with, uh, with all the paperwork, oh, I have to fill in this form, I forget to fill out that form, and I didn't sign some, some form or whatever, this can be a physical problem. And um, I can, you tend to work with it, with a form which is normal. So, either uh, because these forms and these papers, they come from Arimane Cosmos, so the, the typical thing to do would be to, okay, I need to discipline myself, I need to work in the correct way, I need to follow the laws, I need to follow the rules, and then I won't be in problem. So you kind of like adapt yourself to the Arimane Cosmos which you find yourself in. But in this process of adaptation, um, you often find yourself being controlled by these cosmos, by these forms and all these other influences which in a way start to, to dominate your life. And you don't uh, grow, you don't manifest yourself uh, as maybe you should. And if you have this problem and you go back to your own cosmos, um, you often see the growth possibilities. So if I look at it from a nature cosmos perspective, I would go like, oh, okay, so how will I look at this? Oh, these, uh, um, all these papers, all these influences which are being sent to me, oh, this is like a big animal which is trying to, to eat me. <laughs> and, uh, well, what is the solution if a big animal tries to eat you? Well, you try to either appease it and distract it a little bit by giving it what it wants, but mostly you try to run away and hide so it doesn't find you. <laughs> so you get a very uh, different uh, way of dealing with the problems, which is also very much uh, more to your nature and helping you to grow as your spirit wants to grow, instead of you become twisted by your contact with the other cosmos. And a lot of uh, mental problems, a lot of stress, they actually arise from people being in contact with a cosmos which is very strange, very alien to them. And it causes a lot of tension to have to deal with it if you don't have enough contact with your power animals or your own cosmos to help you to deal with it in your own way. And um, also in between uh, lives, you often spend a lot of time uh, developing talents and developing strategies so that in your next incarnation you will have a different type of personality or a different talent so you will um, yeah, not face the same problems. Um, I can compare it a little bit with uh, 
how it goes in wars. Uh, generals are always busy with winning the previous war. And they're always like a little bit <laughs> behind the facts. And this is also how it goes for the spirit. Often when you die, the spirit is actually busy uh, with preventing from making the same mistakes as it did in its previous incarnation. But by the time it incarnates again, the society will have changed. You will, might be in a different country, in a different time. So often the preparations are well, a little bit imperfect. Um, so often the people feel a little bit estranged because they are actually attuned to their last life and not to their present incarnation. And especially during youth, and there's a, um, a, there should be a period of transition where all the qualities of the person and the talents of the person need to be incorporated into the current time frame and into the current society. And this is a very important step for which we need uh, parents and teachers and um, grandparents to help us to um, actually reintegrate all our yeah, spiritual talents which we took when we try to incarnate into our current personality. And this is often something which uh, does not go very well. It can fail, this, um, this adaptation process. And then the people will feel uh, frustrated or alienated or out of place and they tend to travel a lot or they tend to try to go out of society because they feel that they don't have enough strength or coping abilities to really manifest themselves fully in the, in the society. Yes, this is very true. You, you actually, um, before you're born, you do have this knowledge of like the crucial moments, the crucial lessons you want to, to face in your incarnation. And um, uh, you actually um, pick also the parts depending on your karma. So your karma is like um, a limitation a little bit of like how much can you learn or can you do. but within the possibilities of your karma. It is your own choice how much do you do or in what stage of your life do you become most active or most strong. Is it towards the end or towards the beginning or towards the middle? Or do you spread it out? Um, these are indeed things you, uh, you plan uh, before. Um, and although that, that we tend to forget because we, uh, we incarnate and our contact with our higher selves tends to uh, become less. Our guides tend to remember. And we also tend to remember when we're still young, when we are still pure. So often if you um, ask a person like, okay, what were your dreams or your hopes or aspirations like before the age of like six, seven or eight, uh, these often reflect really the, the tendencies of the spirit. Um, rather than the adaptation, how we changed our views and our hopes and our expectations because of yeah, the, the, the constraints of the, of the physical worlds, because we have limited time, limited energy, limited resources, and within the spirit world it is unlimited. So we tend to be a little bit um, uh, positive or overconfident while we are still in our uh, pre-incarnation as to how much we can do while we are incarnated. So it tends to be that the spirit and also the guides uh, can become a little bit frustrated, but it's, the opposite is also possible that you actually finish early with all your lessons and then you have two options. Either you, uh, you die or you leave your body, but the body continues, or you pick some new lessons, some new things to learn. So it's also possible to be a better student than, uh, than expected, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. It's, um, you, you can also uh, excarnate while the body still continues. 
um, the body is then made available for another spirit and um, you have kind of two types of this you have a, a walk-in and a blend-in uh, walk-in is basically that the uh, the new personality the new spirit which lives in the body actually over starts to overwrite the old patterns and to reshape the body the consciousness the personality uh, to fit itself to reflect itself so usually after in a period of yeah three to five years the person will change completely into uh, a reflection of the new spirit which inhabits their body and blending is basically the new spirit inhabits the body but it uh, it just tries to use the already pre-existing structures uh, so but it will just take the life in a new direction because they want to learn different things or develop different things um, this can happen in a very friendly manner it can be that the original spirit yeah uh, has had enough or yeah has learned all it needs to know and just leaves the body and it decides to yeah just to keep it available for other beings so they don't have to go through the whole birthing process and having to build up a personality they can start with a pre-existing set of skills uh, it can also happen in a hostile way because uh, this is how a lot of uh, migration actually happens between solar systems that uh, spirits coming from another solar system they look for uh, bodies to inhabit and um, they can uh, remove the original host and move into the body so that's more of a hostile takeover um, usually hostile takeovers tend to be blend-ins because they don't want to make it known that they've actually hijacked the body so the person will slowly will seem to change slowly but energetically, yeah, the whole structure will be very different. It's just in the outward behavior that it's not very apparent. And um, a lot of meditation and healing techniques are actually a little bit traps in that way. So there are, like for instance, um, a group of 10 invaders come here to Earth. They say like, okay, we've got this healing technique and da di da di da and we do meditations and group healings and whatever. And they use this uh, so-called healings to alter the energy body so it becomes more easily controlled by a spirit of their kind than for the original spirit so that it's very easy to take over the body. Yes, it is, it is a rather, rather strange idea, but um, I've had some first-hand experience with it, actually. It's, um, at the time, I was um, uh, working at a call center. And as you can imagine, working at a call center is a, not a very uh, spiritually engaging job. Uh, so my own spirit was like really bored and frustrated with my life and was quite unhappy. So it decided to leave and to disincarnate, to go out of my body, to go to develop itself further and do some other things. And if the spirit doesn't, if the body does not have a spirit in it, it tends to quickly yeah, degrade, go into chaos because there is no harmonizing force. Um, so it, it will last for a few weeks, maybe a few months, but yeah, it tends to get sick and unbalanced. So as a temporary measure, because my spirit was thinking, okay, I will return later when, um, when yeah, Hanko has changed his job. So it actually inserted the spirit of a cow uh, inside my body. Uh, the spirit of a cow inhabited my body. Um, so it was not a human type of spirit which was uh, uh, manifesting in my body. And... As you can imagine, uh, uh, for a cow, uh, even a job at a call center is mildly interesting, <laughs> even though it is not for a human. <laughs> okay, 
So the cow was quite interested in being in my body, but it was actually still more interested in all the different types of grass and plants which were growing everywhere. So I spent a lot of time walking outside and looking at grass and <laughs> doing other things. But yeah, it maintained my body for a few months until yeah, the situation changed and yeah, I got another spirit kind of in between before I got my own spirit back. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, my spirit was actually um, uh, busy with with work, uh, with improving its relationship to to the to the deities. Um, so yeah, it, it had a good time, and the cow had a good time. So it was a, a good solution in the end. <laughs> but it would have been better if it wouldn't have been necessary, of course. But yeah, sometimes you get into situations which are difficult to bear. And um, this is also a process which, uh, which happens in, in many saints. So of many saints it is also told that um, when they're tortured or when they're uh, um, put on the, uh, on the stake to be burned or other things that um, they don't suffer or the flyer doesn't harm them or other things. And this is also because the original spirit leaves and often a spirit from yeah angelic cosmos comes in to con yeah to control the fire or to make sure that the body is not hurt or uh, other things. So the miracles are in a way uh, not always performed by the spirit of the saint inhabiting the body, but because the saint has such a great contact uh, with the Holy Spirit that yeah they they switch him around. Um, yeah, because for a human being it is very difficult to be yeah, tortured and to suffer like that. And yeah. No, no, it is just the, the, the longer... Um, the spirit inhabits the vessel, the more uh, traits it will show of the spirit. So it is like a, like a block of clay and the spirit working in it is slowly shaping it. But also the, the consciousness of the body is also shaped by all the things which happen to it. Astrological influences and yeah, uh, hereditary influences. Um, so there are a lot of influences shaping the incarnated personality, but indeed the spirit is just one of them. And if there is another spirit, it will slowly reshape the, the incarnated consciousness. But from the perspective of the incarnated consciousness, you don't notice a lot of change if your spirit changes. But uh, you do notice uh, a change mainly in inspiration, because this is the, the role of the spirit, to, to guide you, to inspire you, to move you into new directions. What do you want to do? What do you want to create? And yeah, if while the cow was there, it was, yeah, my only inspiration was to go outside and look at plants. Uh, while if my own spirit is here, it is interested in a lot more things. <laughs> Yes, um, in, in a way our consciousness exists on, on many different levels. So it exists on the, on the level of the, um, in a way, um, the part of us which has just fallen out of the, the parental universe. Um, so this is actually the layer which is uh, uh, still in a, in a state of enlightenment. It is, it is free to do whatever it likes. It can, it is not connected to, to anything but it's therefore also uh, immobile um, and to, uh, to become mobile it has to connect itself to a flow of energy um, and therefore it has to go a little bit lower and become connected 
to a god or a goddess or the energy of the god or the goddess or a solar system or another place where certain things are happening. And um, when it has formed this identification with a certain planet, then it can form a, a deeper in identification and can identify with the species. Uh, and after it has identified with the species, it can identify with uh, a specific uh, member of the species. So you can think like, okay, I'm not just human, but I'm a, a male human or a female human, and I'm Asian or Caucasian or um, African or... Um, and you further, in a way, define yourself, you further narrow yourself until you finally become an, an incarnated form, which is very narrow, but also very stable. And it's actually this, um, um, it's a gradual process from, because if you just enter this universe, you can do pretty much everything, all the universe is possible, but there's also no focus. And your focus narrows, narrows and narrows until you actually end, yeah, in yeah, more or less the bottom layer and the bottom layer is actually quite a bit still below the human form. Um, so there are definitely species and forms which are a lot more primitive, a lot more narrow in their experience. Um, for instance, stones or insects um, are examples of that. Um, but in a way, all these levels of consciousness, they, they coexist. So in the same time, I'm, in, I'm a human being, but I'm also a spirit and I'm also part of the collective consciousness of the humans, collective consciousness of the earth, and uh, yeah, connected to all kinds of divinities and connected to ultimately my, uh, my soul, my, my core being, which has fallen out of the universe, my angelic self, uh, you could say, or fallen angelic self. And it is by um, basically removing these uh, the, the 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 lower levels that we become aware of the higher levels. Um, so, for instance, if um, um, I want to lower myself and I um, I stamp on my foot, then my consciousness goes all the way into my body, and it's no longer in my emotion or in my thoughts. But if I forget about my body, I will feel my emotions, I will feel my thoughts. And if I remove also my, uh, my thoughts, only my emotions remain, then I can be, yeah, become disembodied. And I can turn into uh, to a spirit. And if I remove also my emotions, then I can identify with, yeah, with just a collective consciousness. But you have to have a certain uh, neutrality, a certain remove. And if I lose my personality, then I can go even deeper in the collective consciousness and I can go into the collective consciousness of the earth instead of just of the human collective consciousness. And it is by basically peeling away these lower levels that we can attain a higher state of consciousness. But every time we, yeah, because we exist in this world, we're constantly pulled back by these lower vibrations we're in contact with. And you can, of course, try to hide from it and go into a monastery, or uh, this is an easy way to, to, in a way, elevate your consciousness. But ultimately, the, the trick is to learn how to deal with all these lower energies so they obey the higher consciousness and don't disrupt it anymore. Yes, yes, and ultimately, the, the, um, in, in general, the, the essential sin is, is free will. Um, because we have all been given free will, but most of the, the angelic beings, which are not fallen, uh, they have decided to, to attune their own will to the will of the Absolute. So they have the possibility to do their own thing, but they choose not to. And we have chosen to follow our, our ideas of what is good or what is right or what is interesting, 
instead of being attuned or guided purely by, by the Absolute. So the... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And ultimately what we, what we should try to achieve is that we, um, we learn about the Absolute. And by learning about the Absolute we can try to become a little bit more like the Absolute. And the more we become like the Absolute the less our will will divert from uh, the will of the Absolute. So even an angel doesn't have the complete will of the Absolute, but it is close enough. There's not too much disharmony and not too much disturbance, so it is okay that they stay in the parental universe. And the more I learn about God and the more I try to be like, like the Absolute, um, the less the disharmony will be between me and the, the Absolute. So eventually it might be so small that I'm able to, to remain within the parental universe without falling out of it again. But um, this process of learning how to shape your own will, to transform your free wills, to make it more similar to the Absolute, this is uh, the purpose of the fallen universe. Yes, that's an interesting question indeed, um, whether it is indeed the intention of the Absolute that we are uh, yeah, fallen and that this fallen universe exists or, or not. Um, I find this is a hard question to answer because my will is to divergent from the Absolute so I cannot know. Um, but I do know that there are different versions of the story. Uh, so, of course, there's the Christian version that we are, in a way, unworthy, we've fallen through our sin, through our rebellion. Um, but if you look at, for instance, the, uh, the Vedic stories, uh, they look upon it as a game. So, God is playing and he is playing with us. And if we understand that it is just a game and we're playing together, then we can enjoy playing the game instead of suffer and struggle and uh, have lots of problems and create lots of dramas. It is just through a misinterpretation of our universe that we yeah, see it as a, as a prison. Um, but yeah, there are of course um, different ways of, uh, of looking at it, but um, at least my own experience is that um, Whenever I manage to, to, to reach these higher levels or to purify myself a bit more, I feel a great um, joy, a great happiness from the unfallen beings. Uh, so they're very um, much longing for their brothers and sisters to return to them. Um, and since the, the unfallen ones have this desire to reintegrate us, I think this is also the desire, must be also the desire of the Absolute to reintegrate us. And um, the process of the fall is a continuous one. So continuously yeah, beings are reintegrating, leaving the fallen universe, but also continuously beings are falling from the parental universe into our fallen universe to yeah, start their manifestation and their journey. Um, so I tend to look at it a little bit as a, as a workplace or a, or a gym. So um, it, it's a little bit like if I'm uh, unhealthy, I don't do, do enough sports, I have to go to the gym and practice and train to yeah, maintain a healthy body. And if I don't do that, well, then problems happen. And I look upon my own universe in the same way. It is a way to exercise certain skills, certain muscles and to, to work on, on yourself and to play with, uh, with the different aspects of the Absolute. and um, So I don't look upon it as a punishment. 
because it's also uh, a choice to go into this uh, fallen universe. Some of us are forced to go into this fallen universe because they are, they are a disruptive influence, but others have uh, in a way fallen or gone into this universe out of a free choice, out of curiosity, or because they want to help the reintegration process. Um, but if they do this in a way which is not in alignment with the will of the Absolute, uh, then also they become trapped in this uh, in this universe. So it is uh, it is a tricky place to uh, um, if you go here not to uh, get confused and to get lost. So the same, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, there's one more uh, question here on the uh, mystical path. So what stages of development and experience does a person or spirit on the mystical path go through? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the mystical path is um, a path which can already be started before we go into a human form. So the Kabbalistical path, you really need a human consciousness to work with it, but magical and mystical uh, talents, they can be already developed in animal form. Um, the, uh, the trick is that the mystical path just tends to get harder and harder. So in a, in a very primitive form as a, as a nature spirit or an animal, uh, it is quite easy to follow a mystical path because the mystical path is one of attunement to the higher. Uh, so for instance, if you're a dog, uh, you think about your human and you're already attuned to a higher being and you're focused on it and you try to, to learn from it, to adapt for it, to become one with it, to cooperate with it. So you already have a lot of um, very good mystical training. Um, but if you become a human, then it becomes a lot more complex because then suddenly you have to deal with right and wrong, morality. Uh, you have to deal with thought, you have to deal with society. And um, it becomes a little bit unclear um, what is higher, what is lower, uh, what is right, what is wrong, what have the right consequences. And actually this is the development of the mystical path. It is um, attuning to as much as possible without losing your way. Um, so it is not so much about attuning to higher, but attuning to more. Um, so, for instance, in, in a lot of uh, uh, Protestant churches they say, well, you should not focus on uh, on saints and also within uh, Buddhism they say you should not uh, focus on karmic gods you should focus only on the enlightened beings or focus only on the creator uh, because this is the highest influence and it is indeed the highest influence but it does not train you uh, by definition to be a good mystic um, because to be a truly good mystic you have to know to distinguish uh, all the different levels which you are attuned to or which you can attune to and also what does uh, um, a, a principle like love and brotherhood, freedom and equality mean on all these different levels, how to express it in the correct way. Um, because you have the, the four pillars of the, of the spiritual life which I uh, think I just mentioned um, equality, freedom, brotherhood and compassion. And um, to practice these four principles um, is always a, a challenge. And this challenge becomes bigger and bigger the more and more levels are incorporated or interacting with each other. So often as, uh, as you grow as a mystic 
the situations you will be confronted with to resolve in a harmonious manner will become more and more complex. So in the beginning it might be simple, very much like, okay, what should I eat? Um, and you can just attune and feel like, okay, this fish really likes me and he wants to help me and this potato has a really harmonizing, stabilizing influence on me, which I need right now. And using your heart, using your intuition, you can yeah, uh, harmonize yourself in a mystical manner. But as you, as you grow, for instance, there might be two people who are both on the light side and they have an argument. Well, what to do? What is the best way to deal with this? And these are the tricky things. And uh, the hardest thing is usually to maintain the dominance of your intuition. Because often when we get stressed or we feel challenged, um, we tend to go down to a lower vibration, to a magical vibration. We tend to say like, okay, uh, stop arguing, don't shout, let's all just put all the arguments in paper, now you speak first and then you speak, and um, then we are using our willpower to control the situation, to, um, to order everything, and we go into the harmonic cosmos and into the power of the will, instead of staying in the mystical cosmos. Um, the mystic is more um, looking for a way to touch the other person's heart and to inspire them, to guide them, to inspire their own inner guidance. Um, so he's often more of an, an inspirator than a commander. Um, and this requires a lot of faith, not to revert to power, especially when we feel stressed, when we feel challenged. And this is usually the biggest trap for, for the mystic, that they go into power or they go into their mind and they yeah, lose their focus on their own heart, their own mystical center. Um, often what are uh, good exercises uh, are in a way becoming one with other beings. So following the, the tantric discipline. So um, go through all the layers until you can see all the layers at the same time. So um, one of the examples from this uh, uh, tantric discipline is also to look at different objects. So you look at a flower or a horse or a human or a dog and you try to see uh, its physical body, you try to see its energy body, you try to see its personality. You try to see what role it plays in the collective consciousness. Uh, you try to see its soul and you try to see the, the core of the divine which is within its soul. And in this way you can also see that no matter what something is, from which cosmos it comes, whether it is from Arimanic cosmos, Lucifer cosmos, it is all the same. It is all identical. It is all a manifestation of the Absolute. And um, by having this relationship and also being able to talk and to relate to all the different levels of a being um, yeah, this is the, yeah, the kind of the, the holy grail of, of mysticism, of having a, a totally integrated personality and a totally integrated consciousness. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll have a look. Okay, I'm now adding her to the group call. I don't know if the connection is there, but it seems to be there. Okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you for uh, keeping your attention on that. Um, yeah, so the, the mystical process. Um, the mystical process is also a very um, tricky one because we tend to be lazy, we tend not to, to want disturbances and uh, thereby we tend to try to exclude things which disturb us. So the lower vibrations, uh, anger, hatred, uh, uh, bad atmosphere and um, but by doing this 
we actually uh, go into the dark cosmos because we, we limit our focus more and more. So we become very attuned to one thing but unable to attune or deal with the other things. And this ultimately turns us into rather tyrannical, very narrow-minded beings rather than very open-minded beings which are, can deal with everything. And I think our, uh, our master is a very good example of uh, being able to, to work in all different atmospheres, on all different levels, um, in a non-violent manner, in a very, yeah, manner which shows all the, the yeah, the spiritual qualities. But it's not easy to follow. I <laughs> haven't seen, yeah, many people who even got anywhere close uh, to him. Yes, oh, that's very beautiful. We are not deluded by perception, but by fixation. Oh. oh, I heard another very nice anecdote, so I will also relate this to you. So, um, there's a, a teacher, and he's teaching class, and he says to the class, Okay, students, can you tell me about God? Can you tell me about the Creator? And the students say, like, oh, He's, he's very good. And he says, and, and he created everything? Yes, he's the source of all and everything. And he says, it's like, oh, so what about evil? Did he create evil? And the students are like, well, uncertain what to say. So the teacher says, well, you just said he created all and everything. <laughs> yes, so therefore he must have created evil. Uh, yes. So he can't be just good, because he created evil. And all the students fall silent, they don't know what to say anymore, they're just shocked. And then one student uh, says, um, What about cold, Master? Does cold exist? And the Master says, Of course cold exists. It's clear. And the student says, No, actually cold doesn't exist. Because there is what we call warmth is the movement of, of the molecules. And if there is no movement, then there is no warmth and we call it cold. But it's not the presence of something, it's the absence of something. Oh, said the teacher. And the student continues. So how about darkness, master? Does darkness exist? Of course there is darkness, it's obvious. No, says the student. Because darkness is just the absence of light. There are photons and waves, and if these photons and waves are not there, we call the absence darkness. So, isn't it possible that it is the same with evil? That is not so much that evil exists, but it is just that God is not present. <laughs> and, yeah, this is attributed to Albert Einstein. <laughs> But I find it a very interesting way of uh, of looking at things. <laughs> but yeah, Yeah, because often, like, uh, one of the things which um, which uh, Vladimir shared with me was also about, um, in a way, my, my own illusions about my own path. Um, because when I um, first encountered Vladimir, I was very much uh, focused on serving the light side of the cosmos and fighting the dark side of the cosmos. And um, I really disliked all these lower vibrations, I disliked all this impurity, I disliked all the 
blockages and all the sabotage to people's development and slowing things down. And for me this was something to be banished and to be removed and to be... Uh, it all had to disappear from my world and from the cosmos and from all the people I met. And um, Vladimir talked to me about the, um, the work and he basically said um, you know what what the task is of the, of of the yeah the the, the beings who who serve God. And I said, well, okay, please tell me, Vladimir. He said, well, they have this enormous amount of light, incredible amounts of light, in uh, uh, in the unfallen universe, and they take as much as they can gather, and they try to hold on to it, and they throw themselves down into the fallen cosmos as deep as they can go and they try to hold on to that light as well as possible and when they come down at the bottom then they share their light to alleviate the darkness and when all the light is gone they go back up again to get a new amount of light and then they go down again to sacrifice their light <laughs> and that this is actually the the work of the transformation of the cosmos and if you are unwilling to cross the border between light and darkness in a way you can help only yourself <laughs> but you cannot help the cosmos to grow and this is one of the big missions of the school so after that I yeah I still could not do what he what he said but I had to recognize that his way was much better than my way <laughs> Yes, yeah. Hmm. So, do you have any more questions? Okay, um, so I will close then with a small um, meditation. Um, I think it would be nice to make a little attempt to try to uh, remember our connections to the, to the deities. Um, because the deities are actually the ones um, who give us both our blessings and our challenges. So if you build up a very good relationship with the deity, then whatever is the domain of the deity will be a skill for you. You can use those energies. Those energies will serve your spirit. But if your spirit is yeah, too unfamiliar with a certain energy, then the deity will create challenges so that you can learn about uh, yeah, working with, uh, with that energy. Um, okay, I see there's a problem with the call. I don't know who it is, but I will wait for a moment. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll try to get her back. Uh, I can't see her anymore. Just wait for uh, a few more seconds to see if it she comes back online. Uh, call dropped. Okay. Um, okay. I uh, hope I have her back now. Call failed. No.
Okay, I think we're all back now. Okay, so we'll do a little journey to the to the higher world. No, we lost Francis again. Okay, well, uh, she can look at the recording later. So, yeah, make yourself comfortable. And relax. And try to pull all the energy in your body towards your heart. You can go first into your hara to relax yourself more. Let's do that first because I know that some people are still a little bit tense. So let all the energy flow into the bottom of your belly. Gather all your life force there. Your whole body starts to feel empty and heavy. Then allow this energy to come up towards the heart. Make your heart chakra larger because you might feel some tension in the chest because your heart chakra is not used to having all the energy available to it. So try to make your heart chakra about six, seven times as big so it can encompass the energy of all the other chakras just by itself. Don't just focus on the front of the heart chakra but also the back of the heart chakra. It's actually close to the back of the heart chakra are your wings which help you to attune to higher worlds. Uh, the first step which we will do is to deconstruct all our thoughts, all our processes of our mind, of our head. So let it all fall apart, let all the fog from your mind disappear. Let it just evaporate in the light from your heart. And feel yourself getting lighter, moving up in your consciousness. Now we will liberate ourselves from our emotions. Because the emotions also create a heaviness, a sluggishness in our heart. Because we are fixed on being happy or being sad or being irritated and all these energies let them evaporate. All the energy has to become clear, clear as glass, fluid, like water. Whenever you feel there's a part of your heart which is not moving, try to move it with your attention. Try to feel that you're swirling the energy around in your chest. Every time you swirl all the lumps of all your pains and sorrows, they dissolve. And your heart becomes lighter and lighter, purer and purer. Now it is time to enter the collective consciousness without attachment. So here we have all our identifications of being a warrior or a wise man or a mage or a fool. All these archetypes that you are a part of. But they are also traps, they are also limitations. And they guide you on your path, but they also trap you on your path. 
And for now, we don't want their guidance, we don't need their guidance. So separate yourself from them. Feel that you drift away from all these ideas of good and bad and evil and correct and wrong. All these judgments. Let them go. And now it's a good time to st stop for a moment in going upwards to stabilize ourselves. We're still barely human. Now focus on equality. And all the ideas that you're not the same as everybody, or some people are better or worse, or all these illusions of inequality. But also inequality between humans and dogs and cockroaches and flies and stones. These things are true in the limited world of the physical manifestation, but they're not true in the realms of the spirit. So try to rid yourself of all these ideas of inequality. And to realize that your spirit can be anything. That you can be a tree and a stone can be a human. It's all a matter of how deeply you fall, how deeply you incarnate. And that it doesn't matter whether a spirit is higher or lower, because we all have the same nature. It doesn't even matter if you're light or dark, you all have the same nature. Now focus on the second pillar, the pillar of freedom. Because as a human, you're very much pulled and pulling within society, within all kinds of structures. We need to let go of all these ropes which are pulling on us and which we are using to pull back. feel that it is only our own fixation by which we hold on to all these ropes and if we let go they can't pull on us it's only our own resistance which makes us vulnerable if we are truly peaceful and harmonious we are safe we are untouchable And we are the only ones who decide by changing our energy, different things will happen. We are free. It is only through our lack of understanding and through our lack of self-control that we are unfree. But our essence is free. Now move up to the third pillar, the pillar of brotherhood, of love, of connection. And realize that by our journey, our traveling, we are touching hundreds, probably thousands of other spirits and influencing them. We can help them or hinder them. we cannot move as just singular beings. We are interwoven with them. Our lives are intertwined with them. And realize that you're both an individual and a collective. 
that the collective is guiding itself. You are guiding the collective and being guided by it. Feel this web of light, this ocean of light in which your spirit is drifting. And now move up to the fourth pillar, the pillar of compassion. The desire to improve all beings, including yourself. To help all beings, regardless of their goals, of their path. To be unlimited. You belong to your own cosmos, but you are not limited to your own cosmos. You realize where you can help and where you cannot help. What is your task and what is not your task. And compassion is very closely joined to wisdom, to understanding, to realization. What is the perfect way to act or the perfect way not to act? Let this knowledge of compassion flow through the whole of your being. Let your mind, your willpower, your desires, your incarnation, everything be influenced and guided by it. give thanks to the four messiahs of light who have granted us these four pillars to stabilize our energy bodies and to watch over our process of stabilization and guide us through it as they've done since the coming their coming to our universe. And if they wish it can now continue to the world of the gods. And if they don't wish it, it is okay to stay where you are and receive guidance and healing. And for those who want to move up, Try to unfold your wings. There is a part in you which is from a higher cosmos, which still remembers the formless worlds from which you descended. Try to find this energy in your heart and push it towards your back. So it can manifest into a pair of wings which pull you up, which act like magnets pulling you, attracting you to the formless cosmos, to the oceans of light and energy. Some of you might connect to planetary energies, some of you to directly to deities. Wherever these wings guide you, let it happen. It can be a very confusing place, these torrents of energy, these storms of energy. But let yourself go with them. No harm will come to you. Just follow the flow.
once you've attached yourself to a flow, ask for a guide, a servant of the master of the flow, to come to you and help you. And ask this servant, this guide, to inform you about what is the essence of the energy flow you're connected to. What god or goddess is currently your main guide? Try to see also, maybe this guide can show you a little bit of what lessons or what blessings this deity has in store for you, and what it expects from you to do. Because you might be working on improving yourself, or you might be working on improving the world, or both. Maybe you're just there to receive their teachings, maybe you're also there to share what you've already learned. allow this guidance of the deity, of this energy, to become stronger in you. Fill yourself with this formless energy and you will feel that as it flows into your body it also starts to crystallize around you. Because it flows into the manifested world where it will act like a magnet to ensure that the right events, the right people, will be attracted to you. And in this way you ensure your own guidance on your path of light. And give thanks to the deity and to your guide. Pull your wings inside your body again and allow yourself to fall down into the collective consciousness. From there remember who you are, what your task is, what your path is and become your personality again. Remember the journey of your personality what you've done before, what you plan to do. And refocus yourself on your current incarnation. And allow these energies to become partially incorporated, but also to stay partially subtle as you redistribute them around your body. So if all goes well you should get a balance again between your seven chakras but also still feel all the energy working around you, clinging to your body and integrating with all the other parts of your being. It would be good to take a little bit of time, maybe 20 minutes, to rest your body so the energy can integrate. And it should now also be easier to pray to the god or goddess which you've attuned to. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your attention this week and I hope to see you again next week. Okay, bye bye.